Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. The Shelburne Museum is now open for the season. In addition to the museum's world-renowned collections of art and Americana, it is also featuring a series of limited time exhibitions, which we'll get to see during this program. And we'll also learn about plans for the construction and creation of a new center on the museum campus that will house Native American art. To learn more about all of this, our guest is the director and CEO of the Shelburne Museum, Tom Dennis. Tom, thank you so much for coming in. Oh, it's my pleasure, friend. Thank you again for having me back. You bet. And a good beginning to the season, Wonderful I, I bet. Wonderful beginning. Awesome. So uh, let's start with the museum's uh, announcement in early May that it will construct the Perry Center uh, for Native American Art. It is a $12.6 million project. Uh, tell us about the Perry Center. Sure. This is a big deal for us. This is a big project for Vermont, and we're so pleased that we're now able to talk about it openly. Um, Anthony and Teresa Perry put together a remarkable collection of indigenous Native American art and are giving it to the museum, have given some of it to the museum. Shelburne Museum already is steward to a very important collection of Native American art, right. which dates back to the 1940s that Electra have a Meyer Webb purchased an uh, important collection of baskets that had been owned by Louis Comfort Tiffany from mm -hmm. the Pacific Northwest. So there's a real center of gravity for Native American art at the museum, and we knew that we had to have a, a building for it, a building that was specifically suited to the needs of Native American art. So we did a search. We hired Sir David Ajay from London and New York, who's an internationally famous architect, well known for designing the National Museum of African American History right. and Culture Beautiful at the Smithsonian. Yep. Building. So having a David Ajay building in Vermont is something that's just wonderful for our community. Wow, it's so exciting. And um, there's this combined, combined the collection represents over 80 tribes. Over 80 bands, right, and, tribes bands and tribes from, you know, New England to the Pacific Northwest to Alaska to the Southwest. The strongest components numerically are Southwest pottery mm -hmm. and plains quill work and beadwork. Um, so it's, it's a really, it's a beautiful collection. Most of the material dates to around the turn of the century. So it was all craft that was designed to represent these cultures and be sold to other cultures. So wow. we're very pleased that it's going to have a home in Vermont. So the tricky thing is with, with 80 bands and tribes is uh, interpretation of their heritage and, and history. And uh, you're trying to work with them. What, a, what is the plan to really, how you present all of this amazing the key, art? The key word is partnership. Um, we hired a curator of Native American art, um, thanks to some support from the Henry Luce Foundation okay. back in the fall. Um, and so Victoria Sonningren, our curator, has been building relationships with tribes throughout the country. And whenever we are working with a certain band or tribe or Pueblo's material, we make connections um, with them and find the appropriate partner to help us understand not only stewardship, care for that material, but also how we interpret it. So this summer's exhibition, which is called Built from the Earth, it's about Pueblo pottery, has a very robust uh, advisory committee. Well, more than advisory committee, but really a committee that's helping us think through how we present that material. Right, so we, we saw one of those those pieces. You have many pieces of all kinds it's of beautiful work Pueblo that you said. Yeah, water jar, water jar. The, that's your, your first real exhibition, and that opens this summer. Yes, Yeah. and that's going to be a blockbuster. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's what I hear. Yeah. So, so tell us a little bit more about what is really in the Perry collection that uh, you have just... Um, there are about 250 items in the collection and um, costume, blankets. Um, really interesting that Tony and Terry Perry were very interested in childhood. So they're mm. remarkable dolls which were um, designed to help socialize children, so they'll be sort of miniature um, clothed dolls, you know, just like we're used to in Western European right, um, society. Right. Um, one of the things that really struck me when I first viewed the collection, and we don't always get this in a museum, are the little tin rattles that are on the dolls <gasps> and also women's clothing that make a slight noise when you move. So I, I, I What was I that about? I, I, I it's just, it's <laughs> an adornment, it, but it's just sort of fascinating to think that someone moving through space would have this slight sort of whispery right. noise accompanying, um, mostly her is my understanding. Um, but the fact that the dolls have them on them too just gives us sort of an understanding of how children were 
um, brought up in different indigenous cultures. So right. um, fascinated by that. And then Tony Perry was very interested in nomadic people. Mm. Um, so um, there are these wonderful Cheyenne quill work um, bags and pipe cases and all pouches. So um, the, it's just it's an extraordinary example of indigenous art. Uh, wonderful. And what's the timeline for the construction um, of this uh, new center? Soon. So we break ground fall 24 and we'll all be walking in in spring 26. Very so exciting. And museum time, that's tomorrow. And I, I think uh, Electra Havemeyer Webb wanted a building uh, uh, very way, way back, but very it didn't very happen until now. Very much so. The very first drawing for Shelburne Museum from 1947 has in one corner what was called an Indian village. Um, and mm. so, of course, we've updated our terminology since then. Right. Um, but she was already purchasing Native American art. Um, there was a small gallery in the 1960s through the 90s of the material that she'd gathered, um, um, but now is the moment to do it. Okay, so great. internally we've been saying, uh, you know, 75, 80 year planning process is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and with the Perrys, who of course love this area and were here, he was a businessman, restaurateur, et cetera. But w l let's get to what's going, what else is going on. Sure, this On morning, there, yep. uh, you open the season in mid-May, and just before the opening, actually the Shelburne Museum um, was featured on uh, Antiques Roadshow, Roadshow on three, PBS. Three times. Has this made a little bit of a bump, do you I think? I think we, we, we're calling it the Antique Roadshow bump, <laughs> actually. Uh, the first weekend we were open, last weekend, we did about twice as many uh, visitors as we did last year. So visitation was up almost 100%. And then for the first 10 days we've been open, we're up about 25%. So we, we do think um, people are traveling this summer. Mm -hmm. um, and um, our exhibitions are tuned up very nicely for family uh, audience. So it seems like it's going very well. Right, and great national audience, and, and they did such a nice job with the, with the museum. So let's talk about the exhibitions that you mm -hmm. have through October. One of them um, recognizes one of our favorite Vermonters, Stephen Hunick, yes. um, who is wonderful. It's called Pet Friendly. Tell us about that. Yeah, so Stephen Hunick obviously founded Dog Mountain up in St. Johnsbury um, and left us about 13 years ago when he, when he passed away. But um, Dog Mountain is a shrine to all those dogs who've ever been in our lives, and you know people travel from all over the country. Um, to visit and leave you know, images, photographs of their right. their um, their it's companions. Amazing. So, um, and so we were given a series of prints by his mm -hmm. estate, um, and mm -hmm. we borrowed some paintings and furniture and sculpture, and we did an installation, um, really to honor Stephen Hunick. So it's right. it's a lovely, wonderful thing. Anyone who's seen his work knows there's always a little. You know, a little twist, a little humor um, yeah. to it, but it's part of our life with dogs. And so many different media. That's what's so great. Yes. And I'm glad it sounds like you have a little bit of yeah. everything. And I, I hadn't paid attention to his furniture, his carvings, until <laughs> just a couple of years ago. So I love the, the whimsy of it all, which is part of Shelburne Museum. Right. Um, it's also featuring a fascinating and, and really colorful exhibition called Right Under Your Nose, yes. which is about children's printed textiles. Yes. Never even occurred to me. So me either. But about <laughs> two years ago, we were given a collection of over 3,000 of these printed textiles, handkerchiefs. Um, and of course, in the 19th century, when technology allowed, um, we had all these printed um, uh, handkerchiefs, which children carried you know, in their lives to school. And they were all decorated with either moralizing themes or educational themes. So it could be the ABCs, or it could be a, the stars, a constellation. Um, so it's a wonderful um, sort of look at childhood and also how we relate to children both in the 19th century and then into the 20th century. So the imagery on it is just wonderful <laughs> um, and humorous, you know, serious. It's just, it's the whole, the whole gamut. And perfect for the Sheldon Museum. And perfect it, for it, us. Right? <laughs> and the fact that there are 3,000 of them, we can switch them out in all sorts of interesting ways and pick different themes. Wow. Animals, buildings, uh, it's just yeah. wonderful. So another that is children's themed, um, it involves a Vermonter who's dear to my heart. Karen, Karen Hewitt, Hewitt. Yep. Um, and uh, it's called Objects of Play, and it is her amazing um, work, as well as a, another artist. Cass work. Holman. Right. So Karen Hewitt, v Hewitt very famous uh, toy designer who lives yeah. right here in Burlington, splits her time, or has split her time between Burlington and New York, and Cass Holman is a professor at the Rhode Island School of Design, and they're both authorities on how you design toys and objects that encourage open play and creativity. Mm with children. So um, the famous rigamajig that Cass Holman um, designed um, and building on some of the work of Karen Hewitt. So there are historical um, toys in the installation, both mm -hmm. from Shelburne's collection and Karen Hewitt's own 
um, uh, archive, um, but then also both of their work is featured predominantly. So it's a hands-on project, um, and we're already watching you know multi generations in there building things with these right. toys. Right, I, I love it. It's all about color and design and imagination because it, they're very simple. So. But it's not a problem for kids if you let not them at, at it, yep. right? It's just the adults, <laughs> exactly. So inflated objects are everywhere in our lives, beach toys and bouncy houses and all that kind of stuff. And you have pop up, yep. oh, pop up happening right now. So how much fun is that? It's, Tell us about you know, it's this wonderful. Exhibit. Our curator, Karen Bauer, put this together. And we've been working for the last seven or eight years on our outdoor sculpture installations every summer we do a different monumental sculpture and sometimes these get quite heavy um, <laughs> we have riggers come in moving them and it takes you know six people thinking through how we move a large you know large steel sculpture around and so Karen Carolyn excuse me flipped it around and said well let's go the other direction and found three artists Claire Ashley um, new house PNEU uh -huh. house mm -hmm. um, and Tamar Etan um, and so there are a series of these um, inflatable sculptures which are going to move around the campus. So it's going to have one look for a few weeks and then one of these inflatables is going to swallow another building <laughs> and move on to the other. And, and they do swallow the building. So, so this is going to be you know, a lot of fun as people see them evolve throughout the summer. So you encourage people to keep coming back. We always do. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and so what, when you say, can people actually touch these things? Well, I think we don't mm -hmm. want them touching okay. them, interacting, but you can see there are these large blow-up sculptures. Um, they do kind of ask to be interacted with, but we, we're okay. hoping people Stay. don't. Oh, okay. But, but you'll see, they are, they are large, um, prominent, and they ask us to look at historic structures in a very different way when there is a inflatable sculpture interacting with the building. All right. So quickly, the museum also features online um, exhibitions. Um, how can viewers have access to what you have been creating Our website, over the last few years? ShelburneMuseum.org. You know, one of the things I'm very proud of is the way that the museum served our audiences at home during the really the beginning of the pandemic and then also how we interacted with teachers and schools. Um, subsequently. Right. So there's a lot of wonderful online content on our website that wasn't there right. just a few years ago and shows off the best of Shelburne Museum. So you can share all of this. People can go to shelburnemuseum.org, but it's always best just to come on out. It's such a beautiful place with your flowers and everything else that you do. Um, we were just planting yesterday um, because of the frost last week. Right. Um, and I think about half the staff went across the street to help. Um, our gardeners, wow. so it was a wonderful moment just for us to get our hands in the dirt and, and make sure that the campus looks beautiful, which it always does. It always does. Thank you so much, Tom Denenberg, the CEO of the Shelburne Museum. Fran, thank you. Okay. Thank you for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Stay well.